This is a debrief of the ACCA SBR Strategic Business Reporting Exam set in March and June 2019. Before you follow through the debrief, I recommend that you download the questions from the ACCA website. Also, before you look at each part of the debrief, read the requirement and the question, plan out your answer even if you don't complete it. I'm not going to try to show you how to get 100%. I'm just interested in making sure that you pass the exam. So I'm not very interested in prize winner points. I'm really thinking about a normal, well-prepared student and the way in which they should seek to get the marks in this exam. Question 1A. This question, as you can see in the scenario, is the question that's called Carlisle. Question 1A is in three parts, and that will help us to sort out our subheadings in the answer. A1 asks us two things, doesn't it? It asks us to compare presentation currency and functional currency. That is a knowledge question. So either you know the definition or you don't. As you know, loosely speaking, the presentation currency is the currency in which the company presents its financial statements. And the functional currency is much due to do with the way the currency in which the business operates on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's all about day-to-day -day operations. The second part of A1 then says, what do you think the functional currency of bike light is? And various information is given about sales and purchases and different currencies. When you've read it through, you notice, of course, that the word that seems to appear most often is the dinar. And that probably, therefore, is suggesting that the dinar is the functional currency. So when you argue about this, just notice the number of things that suggest it should be the dinar. They pay their staff costs and overheads in dinar. They've got the bond issue, so they borrow in dinar. They've got the fact they've got no financing from the parent, so it's not really financed in the parent's company, so it's not financed from the parent. There's lots more evidence down there, so a significant amount of purchases, 40% of purchases and a significant amount of sales, one third of the sales. This one isn't as clear cut as some others, but I think I would probably say on balance, it looks as if the functional currency is the dinar. So that's the first part of the question. Very, very straightforward way. Um, marks there, seven marks, we should be able to get five or so without any difficulty. Requirement A2 is asking for a calculation. It's not asking for an explanation. So if you're not asked for an explanation, don't give one. Just set down the performer that you've learned and put the figures in as far as you possibly can. They want to know the value of the goodwill on the day that I took the company over. And they also want to know about the exchange differences in the last nine months, again, just before the company is sold. 
So it's important to only try and prove those figures. When you calculate goodwill for a foreign sub, always do it in columns. A column in dinar, a column for the exchange rate, and a column and then for the answer in dollars. So that's a calculation that's definitely worth having a go at because it, could, it shouldn't really go very wrong. So I've set down my dinars column. I'll just call them DINs. Standard goodwill calculation, you know, is cost plus NCI minus, again, the net assets, the net assets measured at fair value. So the fair value of the net assets acquired. There's my basic calculation. Look back in the scenario, I can see that the cost of this investment was 100 million dinars. We're told that the fair value of the NCI was 22. Be careful with the net assets. We're told that the carrying value of the net assets was not the same as the fair value. The carrying value of the net assets was 60. The fair value adjustment again, which they've given to us for the building, is an extra 20. So that means at fair value, the net assets are 80. That gives you the value of the goodwill on the day I took the business over. That's the requirement, isn't it? They want to know, again, what that value was. And then later, again, they want to know about the exchange diff. So the opening value of the goodwill was 42. We're then told that over the next few years, let me just write that date down because that was on the 1st of January 02. The 1st of January 02. What else happened to the goodwill? Well, there was some impairment sometime over the subsequent years. I think that the impairment was in 05. So there would have been an impairment that would have been in 05. We're told the value of that impairment was six. So after the impairment, in dinar, the goodwill would have been valued at 36. That's the position for the goodwill at the start of the year we're excited about on the 1st of January 06. Look back carefully. Again, it says, what was the balance of the 30th of September 06, just before the disposal? and show the exchange difference in the last year. So on the 1st of Jan 06, what would that goodwill have been translated at? I think it would have been 0.38. So that suggests therefore, in dollars, again, 36 over 0.38 is 94.7. During the year, again, there's no more impairment. So here's the goodwill at the 31st of December 06. It's still 36. The exchange rate has moved though. The exchange rate again has moved to 0.35. So translating that, the translated goodwill back in dollars, I think is 102.9. 
The difference is the exchange difference, and that's the balancing figure. That's the figure that we're looking for, I think. So the balancing figure there looks like a gain of 8.2. Check the requirement again. So first of all, what would the balance have been on the 30th of September 06? That's the figure that I'm highlighting now. And secondly, what was the exchange difference from January to September 06? 8.2. So the key thing is only calculate the numbers that you need. It's very tempting to start translating everything, but that seems to be the main thing that he's asking for. That was for five marks. The third requirement is explanation. And they ask us, to explain two things. First of all, we're asked to explain the calculation of goodwill. And secondly, we're asked to explain, again, the treatment of the exchange difference on the goodwill. So I'm not writing out the full answer, but clearly the key messages are that when we calculate the goodwill, you need to explain the basic calculation. Make sure you, that you explain, again, above all, the fair value adjustment. Make sure you explain how the NCI, again, has been measured at fair value. And of course, in terms of the exchange differences, again, mention or explain that goodwill has to be translated at the closing rate, the exchange rate at the balance sheet or soft P date. Because of that, if you keep changing the number for goodwill, the accounts won't balance. So any exchange difference, the balancing figure, remember, goes to other comprehensive income. So there you have it. Up to another four marks there. Part A is a nice question to do well on. Must make sure, though, we didn't spend too long on it in the exam. Requirement B is in three parts. Two of them are explanation. The first one is a further explanation about the exchange differences on the net assets and the profits and explain why those exchange differences arise. And remember, the reason for that goes back to the accounting equation if you have the net assets brought down and they've been translated at the opening rate and then you add on the profit and that's been translated at the average rate and you've got the net assets carried down and they've been translated at the closing rate but the time you've translated Clearly, the accounts won't balance. That is why, whereas in dinars, the thing would balance, in dollars, it won't balance. And that's why an exchange difference arises. Again, it could be a plus, it could be a minus, couldn't it? So that's the reason. It's because the translation process means that the accounts will no longer balance. The second thing that we're asked to explain is about presentation of the exchange difference, again, in the financial statements. So therefore, 
what happens in terms of the financial statements as a whole. As you know, the financial statements are the SPLOC E and the SOF P. In the PL, again, the exchange differences are presented in OCI. In the balance sheet or SFP, the exchange differences are presented as a separate reserve. And maybe you could mention that some of the exchange differences are allocated to the NCI if you had time. The third thing we're asked to do is then to calculate the exchange differences. I'm pretending to be a student under pressure. I'm just trying to get through the exam. So watch carefully again the requirement. We're only after the exchange differences. Again, in the period ended, again, the last period, which would have been the 30th again, the 30th of, well, it says the 31st of December, but the company is disposed of after nine months. So we're really just looking at that period of nine months, the 30th of September 06. So again, when you work out the exchange diff, a column for dinars, a column for exchange rate, and a column for dollars, it's one way to do it. I'm going to start by getting the question slightly wrong. So if I ignore the fair value adjustment, if I pretend it didn't exist, I'm told that the, the, um, the net assets brought down on the 1st of January 06 were 48. I'm told the loss, there's a loss in the year and I just need to be concerned with nine twelfths of that loss. And the loss that's reported is eight. So that's minus six. That would give you carried down. It's not correct. It's not completely correct because strictly I should have put in the fair value adjustment. And that means strictly that the opening net assets should have been increased by the carrying value of that fair value adjustment, which I think if we've owned the company for four years, that I think it would be 16 twentieths of the 20. I'm just saying most of us won't have time to handle all of that. So if you don't, you'll lose a mark, but you'll get the other six. And let's be honest, that's plenty of marks. After that, use the relevant exchange rates, opening rate, average rate, and closing rate. And clearly, as we said before, once you come back to dollars, it won't balance. And the balancing figure again will be the exchange difference. So that might be the approach to take unless you're a bit of a prize winner. The final requirement, part C, is in two parts. One is very messy and one is very, very straightforward. First of all, we're asked to do a calculation of the profit or loss on disposal of the sub. It's only three marks and it's very messy. So if you at least show you've got the right approach, then you'll get one or two marks. I think in the time, you don't really have time to get all of the marks. So I think it's a place where you may not finish the question. The marks in part two are much easier. Think about a standard performer for disposal of a sub. I tend to use two columns, so, but you don't have to. So you start out with the proceeds of sale. That's an easy figure. 
that's 150. You then have to compare it, don't you, to three things. You want the net assets of the company on the date of disposal. We worked those out in part B, if you finished part B. We also want the goodwill, the existing carrying value, and we've definitely got that in part A. If I remember, in part A, I think that was 102.9. And then we've got the NCI, which you would need to calculate. So that's your regular calculation of a profit on sale of a company. But there's another element to it. And even if you can't calculate it, you should just indicate that you know somewhere. And that is that when you sell the subsidiary, all of the exchange differences that were previously, that were previously put in OCI are now recycled to the profit and loss account. So that means the cumulative exchange differences, again, are recycled to P&L. Now, how on earth do you calculate that? Well, in theory, if you finished part B, you knew the exchange differences in the year. And I think they gave you the exchange differences up to the start of the year. So you've also got the cumulative exchange differences. <coughs> Excuse me. The brought down one was given in the question. Again, plus the ones in the year. That would be very messy, wouldn't it? And that finally would give us the profit on sale. Very hard to get that, but maybe we can get one or two marks from approach. Remember, you don't need to have the calculation 100% correct to get full marks. They are looking at approach. Requirement two is much more straightforward. It says explanation about the presentation of biker light in the financial statements. So there are very obvious points. So for example, the fact that in the profit and loss account, again, its results again will only be consolidated for nine months. There's the fact, isn't there, that for that nine months, again, the exchange differences will continue to be reported in OCI. Also, in the profit and loss account, again, that we've got the profit or loss on sale. If the company has been sold, there's not going to be anything in the balance sheet. But something that I would expect you to discuss is remember that if you sell a subsidiary, you then have to think about whether that constitutes a discontinuance. And it's very important you look back in your notes and your lectures at IFRS 5, discontinued operations and assets held for sale. And it would be a discontinuance, of course, remember, if it's a significant part of the business. So it, again, if it's a significant part of the business. And as in this case, it has been discontinued before the year end. Which it has. And therefore, you'll remember it's shown separately in the profit and loss as a single line. So again, its results would be shown separately in the profit and loss. So if your knowledge is reasonable, you could actually pick up very easy marks there without worrying about the calculation. Remember, although I quote standard numbers sometimes, you don't need to in the exam. 
there are no marks for standard numbers. Now we're going to look at question two. Question two, again, is the question that's called Hudson. It's in three parts and, of course, includes an ethics element. The first part is about accounting knowledge. On the face of it, again, it looks very complicated, but there are some very easy marks to get. If you look at the um, key words, again, in the stem of the requirement of part A, the directors want to put certain things through OCI as part of the remeasurement component, which you might know as remeasurement difference or actuarial difference, but they want to put some things through there. So somewhere in our answer, we've got to explain about the remeasurement, um, the remeasurement difference or component. Somewhere, as part of our answer, we've got to explain the impact of the two types of cost, the basic settlement cost, and then in addition, the additional contributions for those staying in the scheme. So writing or typing these subheadings first then enables me to try and get some knowledge under them. And finally, this is the bit that's easy. They want us to explain about other restructuring costs. Now that's the only bit where you're saying, well, that at least is easy. Usually, if directors want to do something in an ethics question, it's probably wrong. And so you can start from that premise when you try and answer the question. So even if you're struggling, what you might do is explain why, what the remeasurement difference is for. Remember, this is the cost or the income or, that, or gain or loss that goes in OCI. It doesn't go in the P&L, so it doesn't affect reported results. Investors want to look at the P&L. They're not terribly excited about OCI, so the directors want to lose these amounts in OCI. Remember that the purpose of the remeasurement difference is because the actuary makes an estimate of growth of assets. The asset, the actuary makes an estimate of increase in liabilities. It's always a bit wrong, not because the actuary is wrong, but because life is different. More people leave or join the scheme. Um, investments go up and down. So the remeasurement difference or actuarial difference is not for this. This is very much, as I say, it's all about unexpected changes in the pension assets or liabilities. Again, because of the uncertainties that exist in actuarial valuation. So for example, investment growth, life expectancy of staff, salary growth. What we've got here though, are two things. We've got some money that is being paid to the staff if they leave straight away. I think that's what's described as the, the basic settlement. So this again is for the, again, the staff who have left. And whatever you call it, any adjustment of that nature always goes through the profit and loss. It will increase the expenses increase the pension liability. That's the double entry. It's the same as a past service cost. So it doesn't matter whether you call it settlement or not. So again, 
in that case there, um, apologies, I think a picture of President Trump just came up. I don't know why, or ex-President Trump or whatever. Anyway, um, so in terms of that, uh, the basic settlement is of the nature of a service cost. So ultimately, so it's like a past service cost. And as a result, again, the profits again will do go down and the pension liability will go up. In addition, the company again is putting some money aside for the people who choose to stay while the business is wound down. So the staff who remain or remain temporarily. And the answer is very much the same, certainly at a basic level. So if these staff remain, therefore extra pension is being accrued for them. So just the matching concept really, isn't it? So at the end of the day, that will also give an expense in the PL. Now, up to now, there's about six marks worth. The reality is most of us would try and get about three by explaining some basics. But the remaining two marks are very easy. You must know IES 37 provisions inside out. It's a very basic standard, isn't it? And when you make any kind of provision for reorganisation, which is another word usually for firing people or redundancy, that when you have any kind of reorganisation provision, remember that you set up the provision again if you can see a constructive obligation, constructive obligation, again, means that even if you're not legally bound to pay them, then you will have to because of what you've actually done. And again, if there's evidence in the scenario, as there is here, that there's some kind of formal plan and it's been announced to the staff, which it seems to have been, in that case, you recognise a provision. So again, the point is that you would accrue the redundancy costs at the time of the announcement. So I reckon, if we don't panic, we should be able to get a comfortable five out of eight on that part of the question. Question two, part B. Very straightforward deferred tax question on losses. So it seems to come up more times than I've had hot dinners. So we're just required to decide whether or not we should recognise deferred tax. First thing is just to explain very briefly why losses are a temporary difference. Remember the reason is that the loss is accrued now, but tax relief will arise in the future. In order to avoid problems, I recommend that for the exam, people learn in advance whether things are deferred tax assets or liabilities. So you don't have to think about it too much. But I'm sure you know that losses are a deferred tax asset. The problem is that when a company makes losses, it often makes losses the year after, even though management say they expect to make a profit. So can you actually recognise this asset? You can only recognise the asset to the extent you foresee future profits. So it's still an element of good old school prudence. So in this case, again, we would say, look, only recognise if the future profits are realistic. Then you can use the scenario 
There are lots of things in the scenario. It says, doesn't it, they can only carry losses forward two years. It says they've got a history of losses, so they're not very good. And the market is down. So once you've used the scenario, you can then say, which is normally the answer in these questions, I don't think we should recognize deferred tax asset. So we might be saying you'd be unlikely to recognize the deferred tax asset. Requirement C, the ethics part of the question, in two parts. First of all, it's asking us to consider the ethical implications in terms of the way in which the directors have been behaving. So the director's behaviour. And secondly, it's asking us again to think about the implications for the accountant. The accountant is referred to part way through the scenario where they've been told, again, that's you really, isn't it? They've been told that they had better do what the directors say, otherwise they're going to be replaced. That's at the end of the paragraph, just before the word tax losses. Seven marks, including two of the higher skill marks here. So if you discuss the scenario properly, Hopefully you can pick those up, or at least one of them. Things to get across, of course, are look for the drivers of the director's unethical conduct. You can see in the scenario that the directors have an incentive to behave badly. So again, they've got incentives in terms of their bonus, which is linked to profit. So they want the profit to be as high as possible. They've also got an incentive because of the debt covenant. The debt covenant, again, is a promise to the bank that the company's assets will not fall below a certain level or its liabilities not above a certain level. So they've got an incentive to overstate profit, to overstate assets, to understate liabilities. And of course, we can then apply that to the scenario because the changes they've put through would be to understate profits with the pension, to understate profits with the deferred tax, to overstate assets on the deferred tax. So again, apply to the scenario. I'll just put one example down. Again, they want to overstate the deferred tax asset. Always then remember that there's credit going if you mention the ACCA Code of Ethics. After that, explain and apply relevant principles. So apply relevant principles Personally, I wouldn't write them all out. I just pick the ones that are useful. In this case, the directors are more wicked than ignorant. It's not about their incompetence. It's about their wickedness. So I would probably apply principles like integrity, failure to have straightforward business conduct, or and or professional behavior conduct that would lower, you know, the status of our profession. If you identify the, prob the principle, make sure you then briefly explain what it means. Finally, the poor old accountant, of course, because of this manipulation of the, of the, by the directors, they are clearly intimidating him. So the accountant faces 
an intimidation threat because she or he is going to get the sack if they don't comply. So essentially again, so that's dismissal. And then think about action that you would take. And generally, you can more or less go down the same route with most of the questions here. As the accountant, I need to look at internal remedies, like talking to the senior management. Remember, the non-executives, those charged with governance, those charged with governance, the non-execs. Maybe I'm looking outside the business at legal advice. Maybe I'm considering resignation. Remember, it would be a terrible shame if you spent ages doing a obscure calculation and getting that perfect for one mark and then you didn't spend 10 or 12 minutes on this because I think this is a place where we could probably score six out of the seven marks. And that would be wonderful. Question three, part A, a question asking us to apply our accounting knowledge to some unusual situations. So this is question three, the one about the, which starts out describing a company called Crypto in part A. And in respect of that, we are supposed to be, if you look at the requirement, explain how things are accounted for. So how to account for them, how they would be in the soft P, the balance sheet, the PL, OCI, or elsewhere. The first part isn't too bad if you keep your head straight. So they have got an investment in a company called Quran or current and of course it's a 45 percent investment in the syllabus you have to know about three types of investment don't we or large investment you have to know about an associate you have to know about a joint venture if it's actually a corporate entity and you have to know about a subsidiary so as you're panicking here, but don't panic, stick down your basic knowledge. Your basic knowledge is that an associate, of course, is a company in which you have significant influence. JV is where you have joint control. Subsidiary is where you have control. you must be able to define control. Look back in our course notes for the definition. I won't write it out there in full, but again, it's words like power to control the relevant activities of the investee. So you would need the proper definition. It's not enough to say more than 50% because the world has moved on. The point about joint control, the JV one, is that there must be a right of veto. And once we've got down some basic knowledge, then we need to think about applying these to the scenario. In this case, I do have significant influence. I've got, for example, four-eighths of the directors or half the directors. Not more than half. So it does sound strongly like it's an associate. What about right of veto? Well, in terms of right of veto, in this scenario, only I have a right to veto. The other parties do not. So in terms of right of veto, the other investors, again, do not have a veto right. 
So it doesn't sound like a joint venture. Finally, is it a subsidiary? Well, if it's a subsidiary again, I would have to see that I can actually control the activities. The point is I can't because the other investors could gang up with on me every time and disagree. So at the end of the day, I cannot control the votes. Even if you just said something straightforward, like at the board meeting or whatever, so everyone else could gang up against me. So in my view, therefore, I don't have the majority of votes. So I think it's most likely to be an associate. Six marks. Two marks for saying why it's an associate. Two marks for saying why it's not a JV. And two marks for saying why it's not a subsidiary. Not too bad, that part. Again, if you apply incorrectly, it's not the end of the world. They just want to see you have the knowledge and that you have the definitions. The second part of the question, again, is much more mysterious. Again, it's about this mysterious forward contract. And when we look at this forward contract, try to get hold of the basic marks. Well, there's some debate about whether it's a derivative. So in terms of easy marks, again, define derivative. And please learn that definition from the notes. Please, you can't say derivative is an option or future. That's not the definition in IFRS 9. If you look back in our notes, it's something whose value is linked to the value of an underlying asset. It's something that's settled at a future date and something that requires little or no future investment. The other word that you perhaps know from the notes, I'll explain it more in a minute, is another easy mark to try and pick up, is to explain the impact of these words, executory contract. If I agree to go into a forward contract, forget about this one, but imagine I go into a forward contract to buy fuel, Lyman like Airline. Most of the time, that contract is settled in cash. So at the end of the contract, the bank doesn't give me any oil, they give me cash or vice versa. It's a bet on the price of oil. Those are the contracts which are covered by IFRS 9. Sometimes a farmer might, for example, again, um, sell his corn forward. And at the end of the contract, it's not a bet on the price of corn. He or she will actually physically deliver the, coin, the corn. That's an executory contract. Executory contracts are ones that end in the physical again. So they result in the physical delivery of the asset, the physical delivery of the underlying. So at the end of the contract, they will actually deliver the corn. Those are not in the scope of IFRS 9. So essentially, if I've agreed to buy a machine next year at a fixed price from a foreign country, whatever it happens to be, in that case, that is simply an executory contract. I book nothing until next year when I get the machine. Trying to apply it to this scenario, he's talking in the first part about something called an embedded derivative, which comes up very, very, very rarely. So I wouldn't lose too much sleep about it. But his argument is that that contract in the first part of the scenario is really two contracts. First of all, it's a contract to buy electricity. 
And of course, ultimately, um, I know it's uh, the currency in this exam is dollars. I know it doesn't actually mean, you know, America, but pretend it's in America. I'm an American company buying some electricity. If you notice, the currency of settlement is not what you would expect. Because in fact, I'm not going to pay them in dollars. Actually, I'm going to pay them in euro. So in addition, there is also some kind of euro dollar derivative. He's not asking us for numbers. All he's asking us to say is that perhaps those contracts should be accounted for separately. So again, in terms of emergency marks, the main contract to buy the electric is a host contract. The other contract is known as an embedded derivative. As I said before, don't get terribly excited. Um, the thing that you must know about derivatives, though, is that all derivatives are, of course, measured at fair value. And if, when they go up or down, gains and losses, gains and losses go to the profit and loss. They don't go to OCI. So that's not a question I'd spend hours on because it probably won't repeat itself like that for a long time. E is about lease accounting and the impact on investors. When the question was set, IFRS 16 had just been introduced. So in some ways, this was a question of its time before the standard came in many leases were not on the balance sheet. They were simply accounted for as rental expense, particularly building leases. Nowadays, with the new standard, of course, virtually all leases are on the balance sheet, unless they're very short, less than a year, unless they're very small, less than $5,000. So, we would not be asked that question in exactly the same format. But the key thing, of course, is that when leases came onto the balance sheet, so it was all about the capitalization of virtually all leases. And the message, of course, about that is that therefore, essentially, you've got more liabilities in the balance sheet. So as a result, gearing would go up, essentially. That's why the standard has been so unpopular, an increase in gearing, which makes the, helps the investor to understand the true extent of the company's borrowings. Now, in the second part of the question, they asked us to think about the impact of this on certain accounting ratios. And although the question may not repeat in that formula, you do make need to make sure you know the definitions of those ratios, particularly things like capital employed. And so, so that you can then attempt to say what the impact on the ratios is. I've just drawn up a little PL and balance sheet here for a moment. So you can see in my profit and loss, revenue of 100, expenses of 60, interest of 10. The 40 is PBIT, otherwise known as EBIT. In my balance sheet, again, I've got non current assets and current assets. Equity, remember, equity is the share capital and the profit and loss. Liabilities, I'm just going to pretend that all debt, so we'll forget current liabilities, just to make life easier. So when you're looking through the ACCA answer on this and trying to reconcile what they're saying, do it in the context of these numbers. They asked us to think what would happen again to EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. 
The point is that if the lease is not on the balance sheet, so essentially all of the rental cost would go through expenses, but under IFRS 16, some of the rental cost would go into expenses and some goes into finance cost. So although it sounds strange, um, essentially the profit before interest would actually be a bit better because a lot of the cost will be finance cost instead of regular operating expenses. They also asked us again about interest cover. Well, if you've got the asset capitalized on the balance sheet, you'll have a big finance cost in the P&L. So if you've got a big finance cost, that probably means that interest cover is going to fall. Interest cover, profit before interest over interest. If you've forgotten your ratios, look back at our financial reporting materials and follow through the lectures there. You certainly need to have a look at that before the real exam. They asked us as well about capital employed. Look at that balance sheet. What is capital employed? Is it 400 or 600? Capital employed is 600. Please remember, capital employed is debt plus equity. I'll just write that down. And maybe you should write it somewhere very significant. So capital employed is debt plus equity. If you bring these assets onto the balance sheet, you're bringing on the corresponding liabilities, so debt will be larger. So capital employed will be larger. Finally, they refer to a ratio there called EBITDA. EBITDA is often used to help people value businesses. They strip out, again, not only interest and tax, but also depreciation and amortization. So you start to wonder what costs are actually there. Again, have a look at the online lecture in the SBR material, again, on interpretation where we talk a bit about EBITDA and the problems it gives rise to. So that's not a full answer to this question because the question won't repeat itself in the same form, but hopefully some useful pointers. So we come to question four. Question four, the first part, again, question four, part A, asks us to explain the recognition rules for assets and liabilities according to the conceptual framework. Knowledge, and if you don't put that knowledge down, it's unforgivable. It really is unforgivable because, you know, it's the first thing that you ever learn when you do your accounting. Um, and because, as you know, you recognise assets and liabilities if they give, if you can do so, um, and it gives faithful representation, and it's relevant, and the benefits exceed the costs. You probably won't be asked about the old framework going forward because it's now almost gone away forever. The previous framework said you should only recognize assets if they're probable. This says recognize all assets if faithful representation and relevance and benefits exceed cost. So that's the key message from that first part of the question. As I said, we probably won't be asked to contrast it with the old framework now. The old framework, though, said you recognize assets if they are probable. That was the first part of A. In the second part, again, it's saying, well, 
how was the old framework inconsistent with the uh, how was it inconsistent again with certain definitions in the standards again the precise inconsistency compared to the old framework again probably isn't going to get asked again but it's worth just pausing on those standards for a moment and saying well when do you recognize assets and liabilities under the two standards that are indicated they ask us about IES 12 deferred tax and they ask us about IES 37 again in terms of provisions and contingencies and so on so in deferred tax you can sometimes get assets and sometimes you get liabilities the question is when do we recognize those assets and liabilities so as far as deferred tax goes we would recognize liabilities on all temporary differences assets would only be re recognized if their recovery was probable so there's an element of prudence which is why we often don't recognize assets with losses so that one there would be if the recovery of the assets was probable if it's likely they'll turn themselves into a tax benefit When you think about provisions and contingencies, so contingent liabilities, contingent assets, things like that, on the other side, we recognize liabilities if they are probable, or of course virtually certain. Can you see what a, a mess this is? We recognize assets, so let's say I'm being sued by a customer, so they will probably win, so I recognize a liability. I make a claim against my insurer. I will possibly again succeed again. Would I actually then book the asset or probably even if I could probably succeed, would I book the asset? No, IES 37 says you only re really recognize contingent assets if they are virtually certain. The message of that question then is that accounting is a bit of a mess. So we used to have a framework that said recognize everything if it's probable, which wasn't actually um, very consistent with the, the standards you can see here. Now we've got a new framework which doesn't really think so much about probability. It thinks about whether you could faithfully represent the asset, whether it's relevant to users, and whether benefits exceed costs. So the word probable or possible doesn't enter into it. But of course, that new framework is there to help standard writers in the future as standards evolve. Remember in the exam, if the framework tells you to do one thing and the standard tells you to do the other, which takes priority? Yes, it's the standard. The standard always takes priority. Question 4b is probably a very nice question. The only danger is if you haven't left enough time to do it. Because it's a question on revenue recognition, which everyone tends to learn properly. Um, when you talk about the, 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 the two requirements, the first requirement is about the theory that would be relevant to this scenario. And the second is then applying that theory to this particular situation. When you're talking in the first part about the principles, which is very much about the theory. I know the examiner at the teachers conferences have said he gets fed up with people just writing out the five stages of the revenue recognition model and that you should only write out the stages that are relevant. 
So I would say, look, if you did write them out, it's not the end of the world, but you need to be extremely careful with time allocation. So if you can see particular steps that are not relevant, just don't mention them. He thought that in this particular scenario of the five stages, the ones that were most relevant were the first stage about identify the contract. And the point there, of course, is that one of the things is that when you identify if there's a contract, you only book the contract if there is an expectation that you will get paid. And secondly, again, identify the performance obligations. Remember, these are the things that can be sold distinctly on their own. So sometimes when you go for fast food, they give you a price for a burger, a price for fries and a price for the bundle. If you can buy this burger and fries separately, they're separate performance obligations. After you've explained the theory, and I think we would have no trouble there, um, secondly, applying it to the scenario where I would type or write three subheadings, because there are three issues. The first one is about the O inventory. The second is about the X inventory. And the third is a particular issue again with this customer that may not pay. So you've got this, I'll call them doubtful customer. Now, I don't think you'd have too much trouble arguing the answer to this question. The O inventory, again, um, the goods are not bundled together. They can be bought separately. So you can buy the hardware, the software, and the professional services separately. So you've probably therefore got, at the end of the day, again, three separate performance obligations. Again, the goods are not bundled. In the second scenario, which is the um, X inventory. The customer cannot use the hardware on its own. The hardware and the software, again, are bundled together and there's nothing you can do about it. So I think there are two separate performance obligations. So in the first contract, it's the hardware and the software and the support. In the second contract, there's a combined performance obligation, hardware and software, and then separately the support. In terms of the doubtful customer, even if you had no knowledge of IFRS 15, then you would get that right, I think, from common sense. So if the likely recovery is 80% of the amount, there's no point in booking more than 80%. So again, your most probable payment is going to be 80%. So again, that last sale, I'd recognize again at 80% of 3 million. That's the end of this debrief. Um, I hope it's been of some help to you in thinking about the approach you should take to this wonderful exam. Goodbye.